Okay, welcome back everyone. Before we get into anything, uh, just a couple announcements. So um, please enroll in the units for the course ASAP. I believe 85 or 86 of you have. So there, there's still about a dozen or so of you who have yet to enroll in the units. So um, if you don't plan on taking this class anymore, please let me know as soon as possible so that I can you know, give someone else on the waiting list a permission code um, and so that we can have you know, everyone like, ha have this class full, okay? Um, as well, homework one is out. Has everyone been able to access it, see what it looks like? Yeah, okay, it's all on the website. Um, it's due Friday um, at 11.59 p.m. Um, it's a grade scope. And actually, the last two questions you couldn't do with just the knowledge from Thursday's lecture. Um, but after today, you'll be able to do up until the last two questions, okay? And again, office hours started this week. We have one on Monday from 3 to 4, um, one on Wednesdays from 7 to 8, and one on Thursdays from 2 to 3. And all of these times are on the website. All of them are in SOTA 341B. Is that okay? So if you get stuck with the homework, feel free to come to one of the office hours and we can work through it. Does that sound okay? Cool. And again, please enroll in the units for the class as soon as possible. Okay, um, so before we go any further, um, I wanted to quickly review the attendance quiz that we had um, last week. Yeah, a question in the back? Uh, I believe on one of the forms that I filled out, it was like, can you attend any of the office hours? Yeah. Okay. Is there anything like else that I can do? Because I see while you were like. Yeah, so the question is. What if you have direct conflicts with all office hours? Yeah, you can just email me or the decal email, and we can set up a one-on-one -on -one time to talk about the course. Yeah, you can definitely reach out one-on-one. -on -one. Cool. Um, so yeah, let's take a look at the in-lecture quiz from last week. Okay, so the first question we had was, what's the difference between the codomain and the range of a function? Okay, so for the first one, there's only one correct option. Okay, so we know for a fact that these terms don't mean the same thing, so it can't be the second option. And we know that the codomain represents the set of all possible outputs, whereas the range is the set of all actual outputs. Does that sound, does that sound familiar? Right? And so our picture looks something like this, being our codomain, and our range being somewhere in here. So our codomain is the set of all possible outputs, while the range is the set of actual outputs. And that represents, or that is given by the third option. Is that clear? And most people seem to get that. Okay, just to declutter things. That's fine. Um, and B is where some of the options that should have been clicked weren't really clicked. Yes? When will the codomain like, not be all, like, the set of all real numbers? Because shouldn't it always be that? Shouldn't that be always the possible answer to the set of all real numbers? Not necessarily. Um, it really depends on how you define the function. Right? I could create a function that goes between, um, let's say, integers to integers, given by f takes n and pushes it to n plus 1. Like, why, does the real num why do the real numbers have to be involved here? They don't. And so it really depends on what you define the codomain co and domain to be. Okay? Cool. So for the second one, if a and b are two disjoint sets, which of the following are true? And so what does it mean for two sets to be disjoint? It tells you that their intersection is empty. There are no elements shared by the two sets. So one way of saying this is that the cardinality of their intersection is zero, or that the intersection of the sets themselves is the empty set, right? which we can denote with this zero with a line through it, or just open curly bracket, close curly bracket. So is the first option correct? The cardinality of the intersection of A and B is zero? Yeah, that sounds okay to me. Is the second option correct? The cardinality of the union of A and B is the sum of the cardinalities of A and B. Is that correct? So we have some yeses and some noes. So let's draw the Venn diagram and see what it looks like, okay? Oops. If A and B are disjoint, it means there's no elements in the overlap, right? So our Venn diagram is essentially this picture here, where the circles are not touching at all. And the union of, the, uh, the union of A and B will just be this plus this. So this is actually true, right? We know in general from last lecture, the principle of inclusion and exclusion, does this sound familiar, right? That says that the cardinality of the union is the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B minus the cardinality of the intersection. 
But here we know the cardinality of the intersection is just zero. So it turns out that the cardinality of the union is just cardinality of A plus cardinality of B. So the second option is also true. Okay. The set difference between A and B is just equal to A. Is that true? Again, we see some yeses, some noes. It turns out this is also true. And why is that? Well, it's because the set difference of A and B is a set of everything in A and everything that's not in B. But there are no shared elements between A and B. So that means the set of everything that's in A and also not in B is just the set A because there's no elements that are shared. Is that clear? So the third option is true. <clears throat> is the fourth option true? A can be a subset of B or vice versa. No, that can't be true unless both of them were, I don't know, the empty set or something, but that was assumed not to be the case, right? Because if one is a subset of another, then there will be elements shared by the two, right? Because then our picture would look something like this. And we can't have that because we said that the, they're disjoint. So that's not true. So is that clear? Yeah. Okay, so the set difference is not um, symmetric, okay? So A minus B is everything in A and everything not in B. Um, like that. B minus A is the opposite. So the, the difference of A and B is the first one. The difference of B and A is the second one. Is that okay? Cool. Any other questions? Okay, I want to quickly recap the stuff we talked about at the end of last week. Um, and then I, try, I want to move a little quickly um, just so that we can get through as much as possible. Okay, but feel free to stop at any point if you have any questions. Okay, and there will be quite a few times that, um, in today's lecture where I'll sort of give you a minute or two to, um, to discuss sort of what we're talking about and sort of come up with a prediction. Okay. So... We said an injection is a function um, that satisfies the property that no two elements in the input have the same output. Okay, so what we say is that for all x and y that are in the domain, if f of x and f of y are the same value, that must mean x and y are the same value. Or equivalently, this is the same as saying for all x and y in the domain, if x is not equal to y, this implies, and remember this symbol means implies, that f of x is not the same number as f of y. Does this sound familiar? No outputs are repeated. Every output is unique. Is that clear? And not all functions are injective, right? So for example, This picture I've drawn here, where the left column represents the domain, right column represents the codomain, it's definitely a function, right? Because there's exactly one arrow coming out of everything in the domain. But it's not an injection, because there's two arrows pointing to the same circle. So this right here, not an injection. Is that clear? Because two inputs map to the same circle, and we can't have that in an injection. Okay? And here are some examples of functions that are injections. Notice that um, no two elements in X point to the same element in Y. Okay? It's okay that some things are not mapped to. That's fine. All an injection cares about is that um, no two X's map to the same Y. Any questions with the definition of an injection? Okay. And towards the end of last week's class, we um, talked about different ways of determining whether or not some functions are injections. Okay, And so um, the easiest way might be to plot each of these functions and to see if they pass the horizontal line test. Right? And remember, the vertical line test was a test to see if some graph was a function. Right? And this is the one we talked about that you probably saw at some point in high school. Uh, right? If you, you know, put a vertical line across the page, if at any point your graph hits two points on the line, then we know it's not a function. Right? Because for a function, Every input has to have exactly one output. It's the opposite um, when we're looking at injections. For an injection, 
not only does it have to be a function, so pass the um, vertical line test, it also has to pass the horizontal line test, meaning that no two outputs are repeated, or no output is repeated, right? So what we can do is sort of plot some of these functions. So first we can plot f of x is equal to e to the x. Is that an injection? Yes or no? Yeah, that's an injection because no output is ever repeated. Yes. What about g, which maps x to the square root of x squared? Is that an injection? Okay, someone said yes. But, I mean, it, it's just not. I'm sorry. Um, so, and so it might seem like square root of x squared is equal to x. But that's actually not the case. The square root of x squared is actually the absolute value of x. Right? Because if you pass in g of negative 3, it'll square negative 3, which gives you 9, and then take the square root of it, which will give you 3. So it's actually the same function as absolute value of x. Right? And what does that look like? Something like this and this. And is that an injection? No, because essentially every output except for zero is repeated exactly twice. Right? I can draw any horizontal line. Hits g of x twice. Not injection. Okay, so g of x is not an injection. <clears throat> is that clear? Right, because we, it fails the horizontal line test. Some outputs are repeated. It's still a function, not an injection. And then we have h of x is equal to x cubed plus 3x. Okay, so I happen to know what it looks like because I you know, Googled it right before this. But, I mean, upon first glance, how, like, how do you know how to graph a cubic? I mean, you could do the, to take the derivatives and you know, find the roots, whatever. We don't have time for that, right? We just want to see whether or not it's an injection. So what we could instead do is look at its derivative, right? And this is what we sort of wrapped up talking about last class, okay? And just to draw it, it happens to look very similar to x cubed. So it looks something like that. And it happens to be that it is an injection, but if, unless you knew what the graph looked like, right off the bat, that's not necessarily obvious, okay? So we talked about this idea of an injection test, right? And so, again, our function was h of x is equal to x cubed plus 3x. And what we said was, for a function to be injective, it has to either be strictly increasing or strictly decreasing, right? Because we don't want it to land at a local maximum or a local minimum, because at any point, if it reaches a local maximum, it's going to change directions and start repeating all these outputs that have already been seen. And vice versa, reaches a local minimum, it will, you know, reverse directions and continue um, repeating outputs that it's already seen. So in short, for a function to be an injection, it should never reverse directions, okay? I.e. there should never be a local maximum or a local minimum. And how we can guarantee that is by making sure its derivative is always greater than zero or always less than zero, right? Is that clear? So we want to see if the derivative is always greater than zero or always less than zero. Does that sound okay? Okay. So let's take the derivative. h prime of x will look like 3x squared plus 3. Well, we know x squared is always greater than or equal to zero. But now that we're adding 3 to it, it will always be greater than or equal to 3. Is that clear? The smallest value of this parabola will be 3, right? So this is greater than or equal to 3 which is always greater than zero. So this tells us is always greater than zero, which tells us h of x is strictly increasing. Therefore, that it's an injection. Yes? How would we check using uh, the derivative rule for uh, the square root of x squared? Uh, oh, so you're saying, how would I yeah. do the same thing? How, how would you show that the like, derivative of x, like uh, root x squared is zero? Because then, and only then, would it have a null, right? 
Um, so I guess you could do the one over two square root x squared times two x and have things cancel out. But this is a weird case because it, like, I mean, if you write the square root as x to the one half, it ends up simplifying to x, which is not necessarily true. Does that sort of make sense? So you have to, for this case, you have to know that it ends up being absolute value of x. And I mean, you just use prior knowledge knowing that you can't differentiate absolute value of x at x is equal to zero. Are there like other cases like this? It really depends on the function. And um, like whether or not a function is continuous or, uh, I forget the term, not continuous, but smooth at these points, or differentiable at these points. Okay, but for the most part, I mean, that's more of a calculus topic. We're not really going to talk too much about this. This is just one specific way you can check to see if a function is an injection. I mean, there is a question like this on your homework this week, but that's not really going to be a top, like something we focus on. Yeah. Uh, what's the three therefore. Thank you. I should have mentioned that. So the three dots mean therefore. And you'll see them very often, both, you know, in the slides, but also, you know, um, in this homework solutions, and if you look at any other math textbook, really, you'll see the three dots very often. It means therefore. And usually, you know, when you're doing some derivation or some proof, at the end, you'll say, therefore, this is true, or therefore, that is true. Is that okay? Cool. And so now, here's something I want you to discuss amongst yourselves. Suppose that we have an injection between set A and set B. What is the relationship between the cardinality of A and the cardinality of B? Okay, and really the question I'm asking is, what goes there? What sign? Is it a greater than sign, a less than sign, an equal sign, greater than or equal to, so on and so forth. So I'll give you a minute or so to discuss amongst yourselves and then we'll take it up. Okay, let's come back together. Uh, no. What just happened? Uh, okay. okay, let's come back together. So does someone have a hypothesis? What do you think the relationship is between the cardinality of A and cardinality of B, and why? Yeah. How many people agree with that? Okay, less than or equal to. You're right. Why is that? Because for every element of A, it has to have one of the distinctive element of B. Right. But B can have other elements that aren't that element. Exactly. So what this is saying is, for every single element in A, there needs to be exactly one element in B that it maps to. Right? And there can be other things in B that don't get mapped to, which is fine. But um, every B element in B has to have at least, or has to have exactly one element in A. So let's, for example, draw this picture. Is there a possible um, injection between these two, um, between this domain and codomain? Is there a possible injection here? No, because no matter what, oops, wrong tool. Okay, let's say I map the first element in A to the first element in B, second in A to second in B, third in A, third in to B. No matter what, this fourth element of the domain will map to something that's already being mapped to, 
right? And so for, in order for this to work, there needs to be at least as many elements in B as there are in A, right? We could have extra elements, that's fine. This is a perfectly valid injection. But there need to be at least as many elements in B as there are in A. Any questions with this? Yeah. Is, is this something that would, um, you could actually like illustrate or prove with just the three um, situations and say, therefore, it has to be so? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, like you have one example drawn right there. Sure. Like is, is it, do proofs ever work with illustrations? Or is it always this notation? Do proofs ever work with illustrations? So I'm not saying this is like a rigorous proof or anything. But yeah. it inspired me to ask this question. Okay, that's if fair. I had a question and it said prove this, and I was lacking uh, uh, um, the symbols. Right. And I just drew something like that. Would right. Would it just be a joke or? I don't know if it would be a joke, but um, it, this is more of like a property that is true okay. of injective functions. Okay. Um, and if I can think of a better answer, I'll get back to you. I'm just really visually grounded and stuff. Okay, that's fair. Okay. Any questions with this? Yeah. Is it possible for one element in A to map to more than one element in B? Then it wouldn't be a function. Right? Because for any relation to be a function, there has to be exactly one arrow coming out of everything in the domain. So like if this is what you're talking about, that's not even a function. So it can't be an injection. Yeah. Is it possible for an element in A not to map to anything? That also wouldn't be a function, right? The definition of a function is every element of the domain maps to exactly one thing in the domain, in the codomain. Yes? Um, how would this be uh, the So you're saying, why is there no tail here? Yeah. So um, there's a distinction. Uh, why don't we go to here? Your question is, why is there a tail here? Okay. So the tail you put when defining the actual rule that tells you how to send an element in A to an element in B. Whereas you don't put a tail when you're just talking about one set to the other set. Okay? So for example, if my uh, domain and codomain are both the real numbers, I would use this arrow without a tail to say that this function has domain reals and codomain reals. And the actual rule itself would look like, I don't know, that, for example. Is that clear? So the actual rule, you include a tail, but when you're just talking about codomain and domain, you don't use a tail. Good question. Any other questions? Cool. So um, something else I wanted to look at is this sample problem, where we prove that the composition of two injective functions is also injective. Okay, so what that means is, if f of x and g of x are both injections, how can we prove that f of g of x is also an injective function? Okay, let's walk through it. So what we ultimately want to show that if f of g of x1 is equal to f of g of x2, this means that x1 is equal to x2. Is that clear? Because that's just the definition of an injective function. That's what we want to show. Yes? Um, you can say that like, since g of x of 1 is inside like, uh, is the domain of x, then uh, g of x of 1 is equal to g of x of 2. Exactly. And then since they're going to be equal to x of 1. Exactly, exactly. So let's walk through it. Okay? So what we can start off by, by saying, we can start off by saying, if this is the case, since the function f is injective, this means that g of x1 is equal to g of x2. Is that clear? Because the definition of an injective function is that if f of box is equal to f of triangle, it means that the box and the triangle are the same. 
Does that sort of make sense? And it doesn't matter that whatever's in the box and whatever's in the triangle are other function calls. That's fine. This is, you know, a more, I guess, visual way of looking at it, but an equal val equally valid way of thinking about an injection. Okay? So since the function f is injective, this must mean that whatever's inside the two function calls are the same thing. Is that clear? Okay. So now that we have, now, now we have g of x1 is equal to g of x2. But what do we know again? We know g is also an injection, right? So since g is an injection, this means that x1 is equal to x2. Okay? So the sort of chain of logic we used was that f of g of x1 being equal to f of g of x2 implies that g of x1 is equal to g of x2, which implied that x1 is equal to x2. And so all we started off by assuming was this, and we ended up showing that this was true, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. And so what we could say is that therefore, f of g of x is injective. Any questions with this? Yes, in the back. Um, can you elaborate more on why, like, if f is injective, that means that it's Sure. So, are you okay with the definition of an injective function that we have at the top? This right here. Well, it's that if two inputs have the same output, the inputs have to be the same. Is that clear? So really, all we use in this line is we said that g of x1 is the box and g of x2 is the triangle. Does that make sense? So we're saying f of this box and f of this triangle both are equal. That means the box and the triangle are equal. Is that clear? So the box is this and the triangle is this. Does that make sense? Yes? It's, it's because, that, because we know both f and g are injective. Since we have that g of x1 is equal to g of x2, that tells us x1 and x2 are the same. Not that we proved it backwards, but we started off by assuming just that, uh, like we just started assuming that um, f of g of x1 and f of g of x2 are the same. And then we use the fact that f is injective and the fact that g is injective to show that the composition is injective. Is that okay? Any other questions? And this may seem a little foreign at first, but we'll have significant practice with these kinds of questions throughout the course. Okay, I, I, I also believe there's a similar question on this week's homework, I think, when you prove the same property for a surjective function. Okay? So any questions with this? Okay. So let's move on to surjective functions. Okay? So we say a function f from a to b is surjective or onto... So before we said injective functions are one to one. A surjective function is onto if every element in B is mapped to by an element in A. So another way of thinking about this is a function is surjective when the codomain and the range are equal to each other. Right? We know um, by default that range is always some subset of the codomain. Well, a function is surjective when the range and codomain are the e are equal. Is that clear? And mathematically. We can say for all B and B, there is some A and A such that F of A points to B. Okay? And so um, pictorially, how we can look at this is for a function to be a surjection, there has to be an arrow pointing to everything in B. Okay? So this is a perfectly valid surjection. It's not an injection, right? Because two elements in A are pointing to the same element in B, but it's a surjection. 
Because everything in B is being pointed to by something. Right? So, for example, this is surjection, but not injection. And just as a reminder, oops. I guess you could say this is an injection, but not a surjection. Well, why is this not a surjection? Because there's nothing pointing to this fourth point. And for a function to be a surjection, every circle in the codomain must have some arrow pointing to it. Is that okay? Any questions with the definition of a surjection? Yes. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that in a couple slides. Okay? And so... Oops, did I erase something? Okay, we're good. Oops. Okay, we're good. And so here are some more examples of functions that are surjections. And notice, the only property that's, that a surjection cares about is that every element in the codomain has an arrow pointing to it. Yeah? What would be like a function that uh, like a function that's not a surjection? No, no, no. Like, uh, like written out, like 3x, like, why is equal to 3x like that? A function that is a surjection or is not? We're going to look at that in the next slide. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the one on the right is also an injection. It is also an injection. Right? And so we notice, uh, if you're paying close attention, the picture on the right also appeared when I showed the pictures of two different injections. So this function on the right is both an injection and a surjection. And there's a special name for that that we'll see very, very shortly from now. Okay? And so here's an interesting question. What domain and codomain make f mapping from x to x squared a surjection and not a surjection? Okay, so what this is saying is that depending on our choice of domain and codomain, the function may or may not be a surjection, okay? So I'll let you discuss for a minute and try and come up with a set of uh, domains and codomains such that it is a surjection and such that it's not a surjection. Yes? So what if I set my codomain to something that doesn't encompass the entire like, regular range of functions? What if I set my codomain to like, all numbers greater than like, 50? Um, like, how would that go down? So you're saying, what if I set, um, okay, let's just say, for example, the input could be everything, and the output would be um, the real numbers that are greater than or equal to 50, is what you're saying. So let's see what that function would look like. Okay, um, so it would be a parabola, but we cut off everything below the line y is equal to 50. So it looks something like this, maybe, and this. Well, if that's what we set our codomain to be, something like that, um, if that's what we set our codomain to be, then as long as the function will map something to each of those points, we can say that it's a surjection. Okay. So this would still be considered a surjection then? This case, yeah. Okay. Because you're, all of these values will be hit. Okay? So I'll let you discuss. Can you come up with a... Um, domain and codomain, maybe a little less obscure than greater than or equal to 50, but can you come up with examples that make this a surjection and not a surjection? Okay, so I'll let you discuss for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. So there you implicitly set your domain to be everything that satisfies the function, if that makes sense. Yeah, so there, like, the domain would actually be the real numbers that are 
you know, less than negative square root of 50 and greater than the square root of 50. How do we know that that was implicit? Because the fact that we're saying it's a function implies that it will satisfy those properties. Not quite, and we'll talk about in, uh, inverses in just a bit. Okay, let's come back together. So can someone give me an example of a domain and codomain that make this a surjection? Domain and codomain that make this a surjection. Yeah. Yeah. And then is than equal to zero. Exactly. Okay, and I, I didn't really explain this the first time I wrote it. What this symbol over here means is the real numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. Okay? And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. If our um, domain is a set of reals and our codomain is a set of reals greater than or equal to zero, then this function is indeed a surjection. Well, why is that? Because every real number greater than or equal to zero, you could just square root it, and it would tell you what the input is. Yes? Is there a way that greater than notation sign uh, when the dimensions of R increases? So how would you, how would you limit the range if it's like R2? So you could... So your question is, like, what if we were looking at you know, the, the set of you know, coordinates or two element vectors? Yeah. One, one thing you could do is... Like, you have to be a little more specific in that case. So, like, for example, things you'll often see are where, you know, the magnitude of x is greater than 1 or equal to 1, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. And if you've taken E16A or Math 54, that will be a common example of things you've seen. You look at all the vectors that, I don't know, are exactly one unit away from the origin or something. That's not really going to apply too much in our case. But, yeah, for example, if we draw... Okay, that's not what it looks like, but this is f taking x to x squared. Every real number greater than or equal to zero will be hit somewhere on this function. So this is indeed a surjection. What's a domain and codomain that wouldn't make this a surjection? You can still start from the reals, but what's, what can we make the codomain? Yeah. All real numbers. Yeah, all real numbers. So the graph would look the same, but all of these real numbers less than zero would never be hit by the function. So it wouldn't be a surjection. Right, and notice in both cases, the range is the same. The range is whatever this is. The set of real numbers greater than or equal to zero. So now it's just a matter of what we set our codomain to be. Right? And, I don't know, going back to high school, you probably didn't have this notion of a codomain. Right? You just look at a function and see what the outputs actually were. Right? And so by defining this thing called a codomain, um, we can you know, arbitrarily make our function surjective or not. So any questions with this? If our function takes reals and maps them to reals, then it's not a surjection. But if it takes reals and maps them to the reals that are non-negative, it's a term for this, then we can call it a surjection. Yeah? In the non, uh, the non surjection plot, don't we kind of like the plot that's surjective? So, like, should it only be like R less than equal less than zero? Well, the, de the definition of a surjection is if all values in the codomain are hit. And in this case, not all values in the codomain are hit, so it's not a surjection. Yeah? Are there, like, places where we, like, want to use this and something? Like, make the codomain outside of the range? Uh, not really. This is more of just making sure you know the distinction between codomain and range. Yeah. Any other questions with this? Okay, so now I want to ask another similar question. 
Suppose our function from A to B is a surjection. Can you determine the relationship between the cardinality of A and cardinality of B? So again, our question is, this cardinality of A, this cardinality of B, what sign goes between them? So discuss amongst yourselves for a minute or so. It was great. Okay, let's come back together. So suppose that H going from A to B is a surjection. What's the relationship between cardinality of A and cardinality of B? Any answers? Yeah. The cardinality of A is greater than or equal to B. That's true. Why is that the case? Exactly. What we need for a function to be a surjection is every element in the codomain needs an arrow pointing to it. And for that to be the case, if there's 100 elements in the codomain, there have to be at least 100 elements in the domain, right? There could be 2 million elements in the domain if we want. As long as each of the 100 elements in the codomain are hit, we're fine. That's a surjection. So there have to be at least as many elements in the domain as the codomain. So we need at least... We need at least as many elements in, oh, sorry, wrong way. At least as many elements in A as we have in B, right? Because, for example, if we look at this, is it possible to construct a surjection here? No, because for it to be a function, there can only be one arrow coming out of each element of the domain. So we try this, and, well, there's nothing pointing to this third dot. So there's no possible surjection here. So... Um, in order for a function to be, in order for a surjection to exist between A and B, the cardinality of A has to be greater than or equal to the cardinality of B. Any questions with that? Okay. And notice it was the opposite condition for injection. So um, if the cardinality of A is greater than or equal to B, um, we know that there exists a surjection. If the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B, we know there exists an injection. Okay? Interesting. So now, we talk about the last class of functions called a bijection. Okay? So a function is bijective if and only if it is both injective and surjective. Okay? And uh, another example of what if and only if means, it means this condition is true when this is true and vice versa. So let's just say, and this is a preview into what we'll start talking about maybe on Thursday. Suppose the statement f is bijective, we represent it with the variable p. And the statement f is both injective and surjective, we represent with the variable q. What p if and only if q means is p is true if q is true. And Q is true if P is true. Another way of thinking about this is that they're equivalent conditions. So if a function is bijective, that means the exact same thing as it being both an injection and a surjection, and vice versa. Okay, and we'll talk more about this idea of if and only if, and you know these variables P and Q 
in in great detail. Yeah. Do you have an example where they're not like both of the equal? Like an example that doesn't go both ways. For example, B equals Q, but Q is not equal to B. Sure. Um, let's see. Can't come up with one off the top of my head. Um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I don't know why it took me so long to come up with this. Right. So, for example, all rectangles are squares, but not all squares are rectangles. It's that sort of thing. And that's something you've seen before. Yeah. Had a brain dead moment for a second. Okay. So, any questions with that? So all this is saying is that a function being a bijection and a function being both injective and surjective, exact same condition. Yeah. Exactly, and that's just a con that's just a consequence of it being a surjection, right? Because in a surjection, the codomain and range are the same. Okay, so it has to satisfy both of these conditions, and I believe someone asked about this idea of having an inverse, right? And so another equivalent condition for a function being bijective is the function having an inverse, okay? That is, this function going from A to B is bijective if and only if there exists some other function, G, going in the reverse direction from B to A, such that if you apply, apply F then G of Y, so um, some element in B, you'll get the same element back. And if you apply G then F of some element in X, you'll get x back, okay? And furthermore, the inverse is unique, okay? We probably won't talk too much about inverses uh, in the class, but it's something that you should know, right? And there's also a, a, another idea of having a left inverse and a right inverse. So it may be the case that a function has a left inverse but not a right inverse, and vice versa, okay? And uh, these are ideas we, we might have on a homework question, but really it's just for you to search up and read on your own. Also, I believe when I read it before, I read it the wrong way, right? Um, for example, this one, I said it's applying F and then G, but that's just the order I read it in. It's really applying G and then F, and vice versa for the second one. The second one I just highlighted, it looks like G then F, but it's really, you do F of X first and then G of that. So it's the opposite of what I just said. So any questions with the definition of a bijection? Really all it just means, it's both surjective and injective. Sounds good? Okay, and so this picture, which we saw both in the injection slide and the surjection slide, is an example of a bijection. Right? No two elements in X point to the same element in Y. And every element in Y is being pointed to do by something. Right? What's something you notice about this picture? Could be anything. Yeah. It happens to be the case that, oops, cardinality of X is 4 and cardinality of Y is 4. In this case, the cardinality of X is equal to the cardinality of Y. Interesting observation. Okay? And so, are these following functions bijections? Okay? So the first one being x cubed with domain r and codomain r. Meaning it sends elements in the real numbers to elements in the real numbers. Is that a bijection? Well, really, this is asking two separate questions. Is it a surjection and is it an injection? Right? And so why don't we plot it out? So f of x is equal to x cubed will probably look something like I don't know, this and this and then this. Is it an injection? Yes, because it will never repeat the same output twice, at least when the um, domain is the real numbers. If the domain were the complex numbers, for example, that wouldn't be the case, but that's not what we're looking at. So it's an injection. Sounds good, because cube rooting is unique with the real numbers. And is it a surjection? Yes, because 
um, the function will continue infinitely, uh, like forever and ever, both increasingly and decreasingly, right? So, uh, like in both directions. That means every real number will be hit by the function at some point. Is that clear? So think of any real number you want, like negative 10 trillion or something. Eventually, this function will hit. So this function is a surjection. Any questions with that? So this function is indeed a bijection. Cool. What about this function d of x comma y, which has a domain of R2 now, so the inputs are, have two coordinates, and the output is a set of real numbers. And just to make it a little more interesting, that should have been R greater than or equal to zero. If it was just R, then we know right off the bat it's not. Because it's the sum of two squared elements that will never be equal to like negative one, for example. Right? So just to make it um, interesting, we'll make it R greater than or equal to zero. Okay? So is this an injection? Is this function an injection? No, right? And why is that? Well, so for example, f of 3 comma 4 is equal to f of 5 comma 0, both of which are equal to 25, right? But 3 comma 4 is not the same thing as 5 comma 0. Is that clear? So it's the same property, it's the same principle, right? Just because our domain is now R2 doesn't mean anything really changes. What this, in, this function is not an injection because two different inputs, right? Because 3 comma 4 and 5 comma 0 are different. They both point to the same output of 25, meaning this function is not an injection, right? Um, and is it a surjection? It is a surjection, right? And suppose we, we wanted to show that this function is a, is a surjection, surjection, right? What we could do is suppose that the output is some arbitrary real number r. We can find the input that you pass into the function to get this output. Is that clear? So, for example, if our output is r, or we can even use c, just for some arbitrary real number C. If we input the point square root of C comma zero, the output will be C. So what this is I'm summarizing is pick N, your favorite real number that's greater than or equal to zero. 10 trillion, for example. If you pass in the point square root of 10 trillion comma zero, it will give you that output. So any real number you want, um, this gives you a way to get that as the output. Is that clear? And so if you ever see a function or a question that says, prove that this function is a surjection, what you say is, suppose our ar output is C, where C is some arbitrary real number or arbitrary integer. This is the input I pass into the function to get that output. And as long as that works for any element in uh, the codomain, so like this works for every real number that's greater than or equal to zero, this tells me that there's some way to get every real number as an output. Every real number greater than or equal to zero, that is. There was a question somewhere over here? Yeah. So if it wasn't, if it was all real numbers in general, it wouldn't be surjective? It would not be surjective if this was all real numbers. Because, for example, suppose um, my output was negative one. There's nothing I can pass into, fun into the function for the output to be negative one. Is that clear? Good question. So if the output, or if the codomain was all real numbers, this would not be a surjection. Okay? And we showed that it's a surjection because for any non-negative real number, we gave you the input that you need to pass into the function to get that as the output. Yeah? Why? Because the function, uh, I really should have wrote, written G, I guess, but... If you look at the definition of G over here, 
it's d, uh, sorry, d. d of x comma y is x squared plus y squared. this should be a g over here too. Right? Because if we pass square root of c comma 0 into g, or into d, we'll get square root of c squared plus 0 squared, which is c. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah, good point. Nice catch. Any other questions with this? This is all okay? Cool. And so we sort of already discussed this, but suppose the function h going from a to b is a bijection. What's the relationship between a and b? Well, we know that it's an injection telling us that the cardinality of a is less than or equal to the cardinality of b. But we also know that it's a surjection telling us the cardinality of a is greater than or equal to the cardinality of b. We put these two things together, and what does that give us? They have to be equal. Are there any questions with that? It's just as if we had any two real numbers. If x is greater than or equal to y, but also less than or equal to y, the only solution to that is when they're both equal, because that will satisfy both conditions. And it's the only solution that will satisfy both conditions. Okay? So if there is a bijection between A and B, it tells you that the two sets have the same cardinality. Yes? So if any two sets have like infinite cardinality, then are they immediately, the function immediately is by, is by? So great question. You're, so now you're extending this to sets of infinite size, right? And so I don't know how much time we'll get to today, but either today or on Thursday, we'll start talking about um, how we can show that two sets have the same cardinality, even though they both have infinitely many elements. And what you'll see is that there are actually different levels of infinity. Okay? And it's a weird concept to wrap your mind around, but we're going to start talking about it. Is that okay? Yeah. Cool. So... Um, here's our, our new definition of cardinality. We'll say that two sets A and B have the same cardinality if there exists some bijection A to B between them. Right? And why does this matter? Because we can extend it infinitely large sets. Right? So the, the definition still holds true with sets of finite size but we can apply it to infinitely large sets. And that's why this definition is important, right? Think back to last Thursday when we defined um, cardinality. We just said um, the cardinality of some set is the number of elements in that set, right? That didn't really extend to sets of infinite size because what's the cardinality then, right? But now if we use this more abstract definition that the cardinalities are the same if there's a bijection between the two sets, we can compare cardinalities of different infinitely large sets without having to assign a numerical value to them. So what we'll see is, for example, we're not going to say that the cardinality of the natural numbers is like, I don't know, five. Like, we're not going to say that. We're not going to write down a number for this. But what we'll say is that the cardinality of the natural numbers will be the same as the cardinality of some other set. I don't want to give anything away, but that's sort of the same premise we'll use. We're not going to assign a specific value to these cardinalities of the infinite sets, but we'll talk about them in relation to one another. Is that okay? Any questions with this? Yeah? Well, you can make one that's not a bijection, but all this is saying is that there exists a bijection between them. So for example, suppose this is our A, this is our B. This is a perfectly valid function between them. It's not a bijection, but all we're saying is that 
if the cardinalities are the same size, you can make a bijection between them. And vice versa. Is that okay? So it's not saying that every function between them will be a bijection. It's that you are able to make a bijection. Any questions with that? Cool. So here's a summary of the types of functions and relations, I guess, we've seen so far. So a relation is just any subset of the Cartesian product of A and B, right? And there aren't really any other properties that it has to satisfy. And so, for example, you see here, the first element in A has two arrows pointing out of it. But that's something we disallow for functions. Right, so a function is some relation where every element in A has exactly one arrow pointing out of it. Right? Not zero arrows, not two arrows, exactly one arrow. Okay? They could all point to the same element in B for all we care. Right? Um, it's just that every element in A has exactly one arrow coming out of it. Then we had um, our more specific types of functions. So first we had an injection which said that um, no two x's map to the same y. So um, no two or no element in B can have multiple arrows pointing to. And that's the definition of an injection. And then a surjection was one function uh, is a type of function where for every element in B, so for every y, there's something pointing to it. That shouldn't say exactly, that should say at least. Is that clear? So a surjection is one where every element in the codomain is hit by something in the domain, right? So for example, this case could not happen in a surjection. And a bijection is a function that is both an injection and a surjection. So any questions with the idea of an injection, a surjection, a bijection, a relation, a function, any of these concepts? No? Okay, cool. So um, now we'll formally define and look at the relationships between various number sets that you know, we've seen and even taken for granted in this class. Right? Things like the natural numbers, the whole numbers, integers, you know, rationals, irrationals, reals, and complex numbers. Right? We'll talk about how you define each of these sets and what their relative cardinalities are. Is that okay? Cool. Um, one second, though. Okay, we have the attendance somewhere there. Okay. Cool. So the first set of numbers that we'll look at is the natural numbers. right? And these are also referred to as the counting numbers. And they're denoted by this weird-looking N that, I mean, I've already used both in today's lecture and on Thursday's lecture. And they're the numbers we use to count, I guess, a non-zero number of things. Right? One sheep, two sheep, three sheep, four sheep, I guess. And there isn't really any other way to define them. Right? Because they're the basis of everything else we really talk about in math. Right? So I guess you can re refer to them as you know, 1, comma, 2, comma, 3, comma, 4, comma, dot, dot, dot. There isn't really any other way you could define these. So any questions with this? There, there isn't a whole lot going on. Cool. And so... The first set of numbers that we'll look at that are, um, have more elements, quote unquote, than the natural numbers are the whole numbers, right? Which we'll denote by the symbol n subscript zero. It's essentially the natural numbers, but also including zero. So we can refer to them as zero, comma, one, comma, two, comma, three, comma, dot, dot, dot. Or the union of the set containing just zero with the natural numbers. Those are equivalent ways to look at it. So these are what we call the whole numbers. Okay? And in some classes, um, in some you know, math textbooks, you might see the natural numbers being referred to as 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 whereas we call the naturals starting with 1. Uh, but that's just something you need to be aware of. Okay? So sometimes you'll see the naturals starting with 0, 
Sometimes you'll see them starting with one. For our purposes, we will use them starting with one. Okay? But just beware that in future classes that you take, they might not use the same convention. But it uh, shouldn't make too much of a difference. So any questions with the definition of whole numbers? N subscript zero. And so the first question we want to ask ourselves is, is there a bijection between the natural numbers and the whole numbers? Okay? And so upon first glance, you may think that their cardinalities are different, right? Because the naturals are one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. Whereas the whole numbers are the exact same set, but with an additional element, right? So you would, you would think that the function, or that the, sorry, that the set with an additional element would be larger. Does that sort of make sense? But it turns out that there, this is not the case. So there is a bijection from n to n subscript 0, or vice versa. OK? So now our question is, what's the bijection that will we, we, spit, we, we put in numbers from the uh, set of naturals and they spit out numbers in the set of whole numbers, right? And so why don't I write out both sets? We have the naturals, one, two, three, four, dot, dot, dot. The whole numbers. Can someone give me a function that takes in elements in the natural numbers and returns elements in the whole numbers. Yes. Exactly. Okay? So what this satisfies is the more natural numbers I plug in, the more whole numbers I'll get out. And this is indeed a bijection. And you could verify, really just by looking at it, that it's an injection, right? No two n's are going to point to the same n minus 1 if they're different, right? If you plug in, I don't know, um, f of x and f of y, unless x and y are the same number, they will never be equal, right? Because you're just subtracting 1 from them. And it's also a surjection. At some point, you will reach every um, whole number, right? Pick any whole number you care about, 10,000. If you plug in 10,001, it will give you that whole number. Right? So this function is injective, which is nice. It's surjective, which is nice. So therefore, it's bijective. Okay? And just to make it a little more clear, to show that it's surjective, we'll say that for any C in the natural numbers, or sorry, in the, count, in the whole numbers, f of c plus 1 will give you c. So if we want our output to be, again, like 10,000, for example, you plug in 10,000 plus 1, and our output will be 10,000. If you want 10 trillion, you plug in 10 trillion plus 1, and the output will be 10 trillion. So this shows us that it's a surjection. For any element in the codomain, I can give you the element in the domain that will point to it. Yes? What if you split them so uh, you have an... Like you want the function to go the other way? Yeah. Yeah, you could do that. And what would the bijection be in that case? It would still be uh, n plus 1. It would be n plus 1, yeah. And so those are equivalent conditions, right? As I mentioned before, a function is a bijection if and only if it has an inverse. And it turns out n plus 1 and n minus 1 are inverses of one another. So if we instead wanted to do the function the other way, so if we wanted to do f going from n sub 0 to n, the function could just be f of n is n plus 1. And then we would map going upwards. And that would still satisfy the properties of being both an injection and a surjection. Right? It's an injection because it will never point to unequal inputs to the same output. And every natural number will appear somewhere along this path. And you could do the same thing. Yes? So, is there a bijection between two sets? Is there some function 
Yeah. Yeah. It's not that every function between these two will be a bijection. It's that, is, like, is it possible to make a bijection between these two sets? And so, for example, right, if our sets were, if A was, I don't know, 1, 2, and 3, and B is 1 and 2, it's impossible to make a bijection between, those two th- between these two sets. There just doesn't exist one. So these two sets don't have the same cardinality. So what we're saying is, if you can make a bijection, then the sets will have the same cardinality. Yeah? Yeah. It could work in either direction. You could find a bijection sending elements in A to elements in B, or vice versa. So it doesn't matter which one you make your codomain and domain. So you, so you find either yeah, because um, if a function is a bijection, it has to have an inverse, and the inverse will just work in the opposite direction. Just like here, I did going from n to n sub zero, but I could very easily just do the opposite way and find the inverse. In this case, it doesn't really seem like there's much work because it's n minus one and n plus one, but you can do it either way. If a bijection exists one way, it will also exist the other way. Yeah? Because if they're bijected, the cardinality has to be the same. Yes. But in this case, we have an extra zero. And then set with the whole number. Exactly. So we've shown that there's a bijection between these two sets. And even though the counting or the whole numbers have one extra element, it turns out that these two sets have the same cardinality. Okay? So, sure, in the traditional sense of just looking at how many numbers there are, the, the uh, whole numbers might have an extra element. But in terms of cardinality um, and relative infinity, I guess, these two sets have the same cardinality. Okay, and that will be um, probably the main takeaway from this. Therefore, n and n not. Okay, our definition of cardinality is now simply this: if you can find a bijection between the two sets, the cardinalities are the same. Right, and I agree. It's weird to get your mind wrapped around it because you know the whole numbers have an extra element, but that doesn't matter. I found a bijection. It means these two things have the same cardinality. And, you know, we'll go along the, the hierarchy of number sets. You know, next we'll look at integers and then rationals and then reals. And at each step, we'll try and see, can we find a bijection to one of these sets? Okay? And so this actually um, brings us to this new term called countably infinite. Okay? So we say some set S is countably infinite, if and only if there exists a bijection from the natural numbers to the set. But, I mean, as we just mentioned, it could also work from the set to the natural numbers. Because if there's a bijection one way, there's also a bijection the other way. Okay? And if there is no possible bijection between um, the natural numbers and the set, we say it's uncountably infinite. Okay? So right off the bat, here we're talking about two different kinds of infinity. Right? Right? There's one type of infinity where the set has infinitely many elements, but we say it's countably infinite. There will be some other sets which also have infinitely many elements, but are what we call uncountably infinite. So it's two different levels of infinity. It's weird. So any questions with this definition? Right. And it also turns out that our bijection doesn't necessarily have to be from the naturals, it can be from any other countably infinite set. So we can also find a bijection between the whole numbers in our set, because we just showed that the whole numbers and counting numbers have the same cardinality, right? So therefore, uh, natural, or not the naturals, but the whole numbers are countably infinite, right? Because we show that there's a bijection between the naturals and the whole numbers, telling us that the whole numbers are countably infinite, and the naturals are really just the definition of a countably infinite set. So as long as we know any countably infinite set, if we can find a bijection between that set and the other set we're looking at, we know that that other set we're looking at is also countably infinite. Does that sound okay? And one way to think about 
um, countably infinite sets is we're giving each element in our set S a position in this infinitely long waiting line. Or in other words, we're finding an ordering of our set S. So what we did when we found a bijection between the naturals and the whole numbers is we said the first, nat- the first whole number is zero. All right, let's just make this a little more evident. We said the first whole number is zero, the second whole number is one, the third whole number is two, and so on and so forth. And the- these are like the positions are like the positions in our line. Yeah? Uh, does the uncountable <coughs> imply that uh, we don't really have a reference to compare our infinities to each other? Like, for example, countably means that like, we have an n, n, that we can compare the cardinality of n and s to yeah. say the equal, right? Right. But like, for uncountably, we don't really have uh, a specific like, infinite value that we can compare s to that, so, like, what would it mean? So for the purposes of this course, all uncountably infinite means is that there doesn't, there's no bijection between that set and the naturals. In other classes you might take, you might find, like, just as the natural numbers are the basis of countably infinite, there are actually different levels of infinity past countably infinite and uncountably infinite, and there may be other, like, bases for different levels of infinity, if that makes sense. But we don't really need to worry about that for now. All we care about is countably infinite, is the same thing as um, there being a bijection between our set and the naturals. Yeah? Um, I'm, s- I'm slightly like, confused on the count- uncountably infinite. Yeah. Uh, what would be an example of, of why a set isn't bijectional with this natural set? Okay. I don't want to give too much away because this is something we'll talk more in depth about on Thursday. But a lo- like the f- I guess I can just say it. The naturals, well, they're the basis of countably infinite sets, so that's fine. The whole numbers we just showed, there's a bijection, so they're also countably infinite. The integers, as we'll see, are also countably infinite, as are the rational numbers. The real numbers will be the first set that we look at that do not have a bijection between the reals and the naturals. So the real numbers will be the first example of an uncountably infinite set that we'll see. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that will be a little more clear when we work through the examples of like showing the bijection between the integers and the naturals and the rationals and the naturals. Okay? Uh, and then here's a quick example about determining whether certain sets are finite, countably infinite, or uncountably infinite. Okay? We can probably skip this for now and we'll talk more about it um, on Thursday. Um, here's the attendance link. There, the first two quiz questions, I believe are related to this slide. You can just put whatever you want for them. It doesn't really matter. The last question um, just tests your understanding of injections, surjections, and bijections. So I believe the last question says that A is a proper subset of B. Which of the following things exist? And it'll say, you know, injection from A to B, injection from B to A, surjection from A to B, surjection from B to A. And hopefully that should be clear from the slides we just looked at. Sure, um, let me, you don't have to answer the bit strings question on the survey, by the way, but let me write this here. So what was the question? Like what is a bit string? So a bit string is really just a number written in binary. So it's just a combination of zeros and ones. So zero, one, zero, zero, one, 0, 1, that's an example of a bit string. It's just a number consisting of zeros and ones. Bit string is a, a term that they often use in future classes to refer to this sort of thing. Okay, so don't worry too much about the first two quiz questions, um, but the last one I'd say is pretty important. Okay, 